letting folks in. All right, welcome everyone. We'll give everyone a little chance to get in the get in the Zoom meeting here. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Vanessa with the Dallas Public Library. And I have just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, you will all be muted for the meeting. We have a very, uh, a very large turnout today, so that's awesome. Um, but if you have any questions for the panelists, um, you can put those in the chat and they'll get to those after their presentation. Um, so if you have any questions at all, just put them in the chat. This meeting is recorded, so you saw a, a message that you had to accept. So if you prefer not to appear, uh, you can turn off your video. Um, and again, like I said, everyone will be muted, so please put your questions in the chat. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over um, to our partner uh, on this programming series. That's Helen Dulac with the City of Dallas Environmental Quality Services Department, and let her introduce our guest today. Right. How's it looking? Can everyone see my screen? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So I am super, super excited to usher in the month of February, which is also Black History Month, with this very esteemed and special panel. Uh, I'm going to take just a moment of your time to do a little introduction about the series and um, the, the groups have come together to put this on. My name is Helen Dulac and I am with the Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability. And we are partnering with the Dallas Public Library on this series called Grow With Us, which is Mondays at noon. Um, a lot of people have never heard of environmental quality and sustainability. And this is a breakdown of our different divisions. And you can see some of the work we do. And I am a member of Outreach and Engagement. And what, um, and what we did is we went through a restructuring back in 2018 and our group doubled in size. And one of the new groups that joined us was stormwater management. And I wanna take just a moment to speak about this. Stormwater is anytime water flows across your property and then goes into the street. So if it's a um, hose that was left on, if it was your lawn sprinklers, if it was the rain, if it was snow melt, which we've had recently, uh, that water could flow over your grass, over your driveway, go into the street and it can pick up pollutants along the way whether it's um, automotive fluids from leaking vehicles, any sort of chemicals you put on your yard, or even bacteria that was in pet waste that wasn't picked up. That's how all of those pollutants end up into our creeks, lakes, and rivers. Because as you know, as the water flows over your property, it goes into the street, it goes all the way down that gutter to that big drain at the end of the street, and that is a storm drain inlet, and it's there to remove the water so the streets do not flood. It takes that water directly into one of our lakes or eventually the Trinity River. And the Trinity River actually does connect all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. It flows over 500 miles. So just be mindful, pollution at our homes, in our neighborhoods, even in our city does not stay here. It actually can end up in really far away places. So um, I mentioned I was a member of the outreach and engagement team. We want to empower Dallas to save the earth. And we do that by virtual presentations like this and in person when we're allowed. Uh, we can actually present for your HOA, different clubs and organizations <coughs> in Dallas. All you need to do is go to greendallas.net and fill out the event request form. And then you can see all the different topics we talk about. We can talk about environmental topics from A to Z, all the way from air quality to zero waste. Uh, we also have a lot of information and activities for students anyway, for anywhere from K to college. So with that, I just want to mention our website one more time, greendallas.net. Uh, that's where you can invite us to speak. That's where you can get more information. Also, if you ever have a question for me or anyone on my team, simply send us an email at greendallas at dallascityhall.com. And then also follow us on social media so that you can learn more about interesting programs like this and other things that we do. And we are Green Dallas TX on Facebook and we are at Green Dallas on Twitter and Instagram. And with that, I am going to stop sharing and I'm going to introduce our moderator today. Hello, Helen. <clears throat> thank yes. you. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Helen and the Dallas Public Library for allowing the Skip Shockley Foundation to uh, to host this event and uh, to host this event and for me to be uh, allowing me to be a moderator. I'd like to thank Claire Montgomery and the Oak Cliff Veggie Project for helping me putting this put this together. Um, I think it's very important that we have a discussion about agriculture and the contributions of Black 
and indigenous uh, people have made to uh, agriculture. Um, when we talk about things like clothes, food, uh, the houses that we live in, everything comes from the earth. <clears throat> and uh, when you deal with the indigenous people and the uh, black people all over the world or the African diaspora, um, there was always a connection with the earth. And uh, even with medicine and all those different things. So we're going to discuss all those topics today. Uh, just a, something brief about me. I'm Dewan Shockley. I'm the CEO of the COO. I'm sorry of the Skip Shockley Foundation. Also, the Vice President of Commissary is very necessary. Uh, these are two nonprofit organizations that I hold very dear to me. Now I'm here representing the Skip Shockley Foundation, uh, which is a um, we're honoring the legacy of my uncle Skip Shockley and our CEO. Uh, uh, Nathan Shockley's father. Um, he was the sergeant at arms for the Black Panther Party. He was the one of the founding members and leaders of the um, Black Panther Party. Uh, Dallas Den chapter here uh, that was established in 1969 with Chairman Leroy Haynes went to um, uh, Los Angeles, California, got the charter for Geronimo Pratt. Geronimo was actually here in the underground when he was uh, uh, apprehended um, and my father also, Akintunde Funjo, was a part of the movement. And my mother and uh, Diane Ragsdale also worked in the community as far as uh, doing uh, food programs and different things like that. But this is to honor his legacy and honor the legacy of the, the, of the Black Panther Party and also the legacy of, of the people because we're a human rights organization. And the main thing that humans need is food, clothing, and shelter. And all that begins with agriculture. Now we have some very great people on the panel today that I'm gonna to allow to introduce themselves. But first of all, I wanna to go to my man, Plez Montgomery, because without him, I couldn't put none of this together, man. Plez, uh, I just wanna thank you, man. Could you tell us a little bit about Oak Cliff Veggie Project and why, you know, uh, why this is so important to you? Uh, absolutely, and um, thank you for, uh, thank you, uh, Duan, for all the work that you have done, and uh, I, I feel very honored to be participating uh, in honoring the legacy of uh, of your ancestor um, and, and pushing this movement forward. So thank you all. Um, my name is Pleasant Montgomery IV. I am the harbinger for the Oak Cliff Veggie Project. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit here in Dallas uh, that our mission is to cultivate a healthier, stronger, more self-reliant community by reintroducing the practices of uh, co cooperative community cultivation. And so everything that you're going to hear the wonderful panelists talk about uh, is, uh, is relative, going to be relative information to that and the efforts that we are, we are, uh, the, that are being done here in the Dallas area. So uh, every weekend, the Oak Cliff Veggie Project has uh, a, a food distribution program called the Oak Cliff Veggie Store that was started by my mother, uh, Betty Montgomery in uh, about 2014 uh, and since then we have moved from a once a week uh, excuse me once a month uh, food distribution that was uh, touching about maybe 30 or 40 uh, uh, 40 individuals to a, um, a weekly food distribution that uh, that feeds about 150 to 200 families every weekend uh, so we have grown by leaps and bounds and this is all thanks to the uh, to the to the good people of Dallas who are wanting to uh, to be a part of something that's gonna that's gonna build a better, stronger community, right? Uh, and then also, uh, our uh, we help to build community gardens, uh, some that we manage directly, others that we simply provide the resources and help to uh, to lo locations via a school, a um, a vacant lot, a, a church, uh, hope hopefully eventually some of the uh, the publicly held lands by the city of Dallas uh, that uh, community cultivation can happen on, so that. Uh, as you said, agriculture is the linchpin of human civilization, uh, and uh, uh, it is based on land, access to land, and we're going to get into a little bit about that later on. Uh, we also have a, a program coming up this year that we are going to be called the uh, Garden Warriors Initiative, where we will be bringing in the local black and indigenous experts uh, and uh, professionals in farming and agriculture to teach classes to, to both youth uh, and adults. So if you want to get involved, you can find us on uh, on Facebook. Uh, you can find us on Instagram, um, uh, and we have a website that's going to be launching next month, as well as a documentary by Oak Cliff Documentary, 
uh, that uh, we were uh, very honored to be featured in to tell the story of food justice and how that relates to racial justice. Uh, that, that's going to be going live on February 25th, so please, uh, you can find a link to register for that on our web page, uh, on our Facebook page, rather, uh, and the website is, uh, is coming soon. So thank you all. Thanks, Clint. Thanks, man. Yeah, uh, yeah. Clint has been like, he's been working hard in the community for quite a while. Like, I think the first time we met, uh, we may have been feeding people. Maybe in, I'm thinking in Oak Cliff. I know you were involved in the thing CIVN did. We went out and fed the community and different things like that. And mm -hmm. man, you're you're doing some phenomenal work, man. I, I had a chance to. Uh, Go out there with Claire's um, uh, community the garden. Tentry, I think the Tentry Community Garden. That was at the Tentry Community Tentry. Garden where you came out. Yeah, in fact, Tentry, that's where Tentry we're going to be there garden. this weekend. We'll be there this Saturday. Yeah. If anyone wants to come out and see some of the work we do, we'll be at 1300 East Clarendon Drive uh, this Saturday uh, between 9 a.m. And, uh, and noon. Most of the volunteer work is in the early part of the day, uh, and then uh, some of the, the garden work stuff will be uh, in the latter part. So. If you're interested in participating in that, please uh, come on out and uh, see more about okay. what we're doing. Right on, right on. Yeah, y'all come and check them out, man. You know, I'm I'm learning a lot from play. You know, like I said, I I just I'm asking everybody on the panel, man. Just let me be a student, man. Just uh, let me learn. You know, I, you know, I rather you know I rather be in that position to learn what I can from y'all, so I can pass it on to my babies. You know, what I'm saying that we can create a legacy. That's that's what's important to me. Now, um, we have a Coy, uh, Port is it Portier, like Sydney Portier, is that, is, am I correct, uh, I'm pronouncing it correctly? Yes. Okay, cool, cool. And uh, Coy, Coy Portier, uh, he is the executive director of FAWC Conservatory of Arts and Sciences, which was, looks like it was started by his, uh, uh, Parents Carolyn and Roy Deloach, uh, which were the president and vice president, and also founders of FAWC. Uh, so, could you give us a little history of uh, you know what you know what inspired your parents to get this started, and you know what y'all do, and you know just just kind of let us know a little bit about yourself. Well, okay, great, and uh, good morning. Thank you all for inviting me. I believe it's such an honor for me to be invited to this panel. So, I, once again, I want to thank Pless for the consideration and to uh, invite me in. It's, it's great to meet and to know everyone pretty much on the panel. Uh, FAWC Conservatory of Arts and Sciences was a, a vision who was, uh, was, was birthed by my parents. My mom mentioned during the fact when she was coming up, she wanted to do some things uh, as far as being a doctor, but there were some barriers that were was in the way. And what she wanted to do is make sure that youth of today did not have any barriers, did not have any they can block their path to uh, reaching their goal, to reaching their dream. And so uh, FAWC Conservatory was birthed out of that. Uh, my wife and I moved here from Florida to assist her not only with the nonprofit, but to uh, help her with the music ministry at her church, Fresh Anointed Worship Center in Lancaster. And from that, we met people like Pless and uh, Pastor Glover, who was very instrumental. I don't know if y'all know uh, Clarence Glover, but he, um, he took my family and he taught us about cotton from mm. his yard and other vegetables that he was growing in his front yard. And from that, he gave us an interest in gardening because I'll be honest with you, I uh, wasn't familiar with gardening, nor was I familiar with our history in uh, the black cowboy lifestyle. Uh, and we, uh, with my excitement of finding out that we were involved in the uh, black cowboy lifestyle, I created a documentary along with uh, Mr. Cleo Hearn that chronicles the uh, life of black cowboys. And it's called Cowboys of Color, a multicultural legacy. So with, with uh, FAWC Conservatory, it's our goal to inspire youth to be great. Our youth are already great, but our, our goal is to inspire, inspire them, sorry, to be greater. And so we put emphasis on uh, mentoring them in the arts and sciences. And recently, uh, thanks to Walmart, uh, a grant from Walmart and donation from Walmart, we've been able to get into agriculture. And that's what we're teaching our kids now, how to grow their own food and to be pre better prepared to take care of themselves. Great, and, that, and, that's, and that's what you do at the, the Loach Urban Agricultural Center? Yes, that was what we do there. There uh, we have um, a vegetable garden, we have a greenhouse, 
we have an orchard with about 60 fruit trees. And thanks to people uh, like um, the uh, Natural Resource Conserva Conservation Service, excuse me, uh, we've been able to get a grant to actually build a high tunnel, which uh, once we can get mm -hmm. the clearances through the city of Lancaster, we'll be able to put that high tunnel up. And that will allow mm -hmm. us to extend our growing season and we'll bring okay. our youth out and our community out and allow them to train in that garden. Uh, so they'll be able to uh, understand what it is to be uh, a farmer. Right. You know, um, one thing that I used to do with my children is that I use like uh, agriculture and like uh, the earth to teach lessons. I remember um, we were, well, actually this happened when we did the uh, CIBN and Texas Poor People's Campaign did an event down in Waxahachie and we were setting up a garden. And I was telling them how, you know, the weeds in the garden represent those negative elements in your life that can drain uh, you of the resource that you need to grow. And also people, places, and things. And that's why you have to get those weeds out of your garden. You have to stay vigilant all the time because a lot of times the garden can represent your mind and your thoughts and your ideas. So I think it's important with the youth is that as we get their hand in the dirt is that we impart that wisdom and, and show them that connection, you know, I, um, a couple of years ago, I said I wanted to work on the ed educational curriculum, which was a uh, was which nature nature school because we showed children how mathematics, science, and all these other uh, uh, different fields of study uh, are directly connected with nature and our personal uh, how, how it keeps us alive, and they may be more interested. So I like to I like what you do, man. And, I love to work with you and learn from you as well. And, uh, you know, like I say, thanks, and I appreciate it. Uh, and I appreciate that part on the Black Cowboys, and we definitely will get that, uh, uh, into that a little bit later. And um, next, I wanted to, like, introduce everyone to uh, Darcia Houston. She's a holistic health and wellness professional. Um, and just kind of uh, tell you a little bit about her. But first, I just want to give her a chance to uh, introduce herself and kind of let us know why she feels holistic uh, health and wellness is so important. All right. This is the introduction of Darcia Houston, also known as Major Melanin. I'm so excited to be on this panel um, with everyone I totally work with already and already love. And um, so the community is big. However, um, I do a lot of things. So um, everything ag-based, uh, cultural, um, agriculture, horticulture, permaculture, any kind of culture you can think of, that's what I do all day, every day. I do nothing other than soil, ag, teaching, all about nutrition, health, and wellness. But I would love to insert that you cannot be healthy without agriculture, with you being a part of agriculture and agriculture right being on. a part of you. So I would love right. to have this opportunity to also talk about my website, which is www.darciahouston.com. This is where you can go and reach out for services such as personal shopping. I've gone for nursing home communities to go get the best of the best resources that they need. I also um, have a curriculum called Hip Hop Crop Curriculum that will be rolled out in uh, the fall at uh, Roosevelt High School. I'm working with DHK Wellness Strategies um, right now at Lincoln High School. So I'm working with culinary gardens in addition to just regular gardens that they will be using for their competition, for their ability to learn. Um, and then I have a culinary background. So you'll also see me with the hottest chefs in Dallas, um, preparing meals, bringing produce to them, um, then requesting certain things. So all the way around in ag, holistically, this is where I come from, this is where I stand, but um, health is your wealth. So we'll get into that very shortly. Great, great. And since you are culinary, I'd like to let you know that I like baked salmon, uh, spinach, Brussels sprouts, um, just kind of putting the order in, you know, just in case, you know, you feel like one day, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's great. That's great. Um, and also I want to kind of let you elaborate on something interesting. Um, you did an article on March 21st, 2019 on the holistic placebo effect. Uh, it was in, uh, I believe it was in a 
food for thought, then it, and it was just one thing that stood out to me where you were talking about how natural foods subliminally have the power to heal. Now, can you kind of tell us how a, a little bit, we'll get a little bit more into it later, but how food, uh, food has been used as medicine historically? Yes, never get it twisted. Everything in your garden, we, you were kind of talking about or referring to weeds earlier. And I know you're learning, you know, everybody is, but don't, don't get it twisted. Those weeds are also communicators. They're telling mm -hmm. us what the land is wanting us to do. When you see your henbit mm -hmm. and your chickweed, then you know it's time to put garlic in the ground. When you see, you know, compaction, you see um, dandelions, you know what's going on with that soil if you are, you know, of this particular um, field. Mm -hmm. So to pay attention to actually how you can be in the soil, just touching the soil, you are improving your health at that moment. No different than if you touch something that's negative or nasty that could get you sick. You can also touch things that are very healthy to get you better. It goes both ways. It's not just one way. So I would love to dive into that question after the other panelists are introduced because that's a good one right there. Phytomelanin. The earth produces melanin. This planet is a woman. Yes. This is Mother Earth. When I found out that the planet produces melanin, it just kind of gave me, because, you know, the dark matter of space is melanin. All of this is melanin. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's absolutely right, because, you know, even clay dirt, you know, in East Texas, they actually eat it. But that's another subject for, you know, a little bit later. But thank you for, uh, for uh, you know, giving, DeJuan, giving us... DeJuan, we're going to talk about that, uh, the uh, some of the, his the history behind the uh, the tasting and the eating of the dirt and its, its relevance and uh, what it can really tell you, not just about yourself, but about what's going on with the soil. Okay, cool, cool. Appreciate that, man. Now, um, next, we're going to introduce Candy Girl. <laughs> hey, it's a Trisha Ray from Candy Girl Chicks. You know, it's out. I'm a big New Edition fan. Trust me. You know, Five Love, 1982, full to Germany. I was on it. You know, Candy Girl Chicks, man, that's, that's really a great name, actually. Um, I just wanted to uh, kind of like touch on, uh, you know, have you introduce yourself, tell us how you got started and everything. Just, you know, just let them know who you are. All right. I want to thank everybody for inviting me here on this panel. Pledge, Darcia, everybody, Dallas Public Library. Thank you for having me. I am Trisha Ray, originally from Chicago. My farm is Candy Girl Chicks and Livestock. I started off raising chicks that I got from a local um, feed store. Me and my daughter, who named, who inspired the name of Candy Girl Chicks and Livestock. So we started off with chicks, baby chicks, and I didn't know what to do with them. So they ended up living in my living room, and I had to take a fast crash course on YouTube to learn how to handle these chickens, and they all made it. And that's how I started. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. and great, great. And I understand, um, I'm not sure if you can the market. Uh, mm -hmm. You have a Fresh Egg subscription service. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, and I'll go back to how I started. So the chickens, I ended up with goats. They ate up all my grass. So I started growing fodder and wheat grass for them to eat because all the grass was gone, and I needed to keep them nourished. So I started my hand with planting some wheat grass seeds. It produced. I, my, I thought I had a black thumb, but it was green. Just didn't mm -hmm. know it. And I produced that, was successful with that. So I started dropping other seeds, and then I came up with an idea of having a community garden on the side of my house. So I just started growing plants, and I just like dropping seeds and making baby plants. It's a challenge, and that's how I started gardening. And with the a Fresh Egg subscription, it's a monthly subscription for my farmer's market clients to, you know, always have their eggs on reserve and so I can take care of them, you know, give them some special attention coming from my farm to their table. And of course, I do have chickens. I maintain where anywhere from 50 to 100 chickens at one time. So I'm always pumping out eggs, and that's where the subscription service came into existence. Okay, 
And like I was <laughs> telling, uh, I'm sorry, was somebody saying something? Yes, I was gonna ask her to please elaborate on the type of eggs that she has, all the variety of eggs. Yes, right. has. Thank you. <laughs> yes, of course, coming from the feed store, I ended up with a, a diverse um, um, a diverse amount of chickens and different types of chickens. And so I have some Americanas that produce green eggs. Sometimes they get the blue and they have pink variations. I don't have those, but I do have a lot of green ones. I have the production reds, which are like a Rhode Island red, and they produce large brown eggs. I also have white eggs for the leghorns. So I have a diverse flock. I also have quail eggs, and I hatch out my own ducks also. So I have duck eggs, quail eggs, chicken eggs. Okay, since you, Different since sizes, you up, different colors. <laughs> you brought up the quail eggs. <laughs> uh, your favorite. <laughs> can you tell everybody about the... This is interesting to me. Quail eggs... <laughs> Our energy boosters increase, increase libido. I need you fellas. I need you to listen. I need you ladies to listen for your husband. You know, can you let yes. us know how that works? I'm a nurse by trade, so a lot of the foods that I like to grow and the animals I like to produce will help disease processes like high blood pressure, diabetes, lupus. Um, autoimmune disorders and a lot of times we have in our community people are, have high blood pressure and a lot of the men they don't want to take their blood pressure pills we have cancer you know among us we have COVID among us quail eggs are loaded with phosphorus psyllium iron production which produces red blood cells which help our blood pressure and circulation in our body which stimulates our blood flow, which a lot of times when people are on lisinopril, especially men, their libido decreases. So with the quail eggs, it boosts their energy and increases their libido because it provides, it also helps to produce the hormone testosterone. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Now, and uh, also on the bill, we had Jerry Rye with the vocal alcohol. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to be with us, uh, but we are definitely uh, working with him. Um, I think he had an emergency, and we hope everything works out for him and everything. But Can I do one, let me say a little something real quick. Uh, okay. Jerry is definitely uh, one of my brothers in this uh, urban farming movement that we are doing. He is a uh, he is an expert in uh, in aquaponics and aquaculture. So if there's anyone out there uh, in the local area or wherever you're out out there, I saw, we saw a lot of people check in from a, very, a variety of locations. If you're interested in learning more about uh, aquaponics, uh, you can definitely reach out to, uh, to Brother Jerry. He is under, like, you can find him under Raw Grow Greens on Facebook. Um, and he has the uh, Urban Green University where he, he teaches. Uh, he's also the, the head farmer at this, uh, at a, a, a great place called Vogel Alco that uh, takes care of uh, of people who are displaced, they, they care for their children while they are out uh, doing what they need to do to, uh, to educate themselves or uh, find employment, that kind of thing. And he is there making sure that they are growing very healthy food uh, for, the, uh, for the kids and the staff uh, at that location. So uh, definitely give uh, Jerry a holler if you're interested in, uh, in the aquaponics. Cool. In addition to that, I would love to speak on his behalf as far as composting. He really knows a lot about composting as well. Um, if I had a composting and greenhouse program, he would be the first person that I would go to. And I also appreciate um, most of us, you know, in various different settings have education and some certifications and things of that nature. But he is the one that has the degree in this field, in addition to the certifications. So he is legit um, as far as, you know, what he knows and he's very helpful and he will, um, he will collaborate. He, he provides seeds. Um, he has a very big mass of people um, that also support him. So um, I'm sad he couldn't be here, but I definitely wanted to say that on his behalf. Okay, thanks, thanks. I wanted to add All something right. too. Okay. This is me again. So I wanted to um, let everybody know my end result with farming and ag, I would like to become a plant nursery to encourage people to grow and just give them a head start of producing their plants that they like to grow in their gardens. You can find me at the Las Colinas Farmers Market in Irving 
in the Lombardi's parking lot. Also at in ben, um, ben Brooks, the first Sunday of the month, and also Bartonville at Jeter's Meat Market. Okay, okay, thank you for that. And also, mm -hmm. I just want to let y'all know, uh, as far as my organizations, um, you can check out Skip Shakti Foundation at skipshaktifoundation.org, of which I'm the COO. And also, you can check out Commissary is Very Necessary at civn.org, of which I'm the Vice President. And if you want more information on the Black Panther Party or uh, the 10 Point Program, which we base uh, our organizations on, you can go. Uh, Google 10 point program on the Black Panther Party. You can look up UEP Newton. Uh, there are definitely books out there. Um, but, you know, we encourage you. I would encourage you personally. Uh, it's all about community, community control, and dealing with your community. So, um, if you see things in your community that need to be done, do it. One of the most important parts about what we're doing right, right now, especially in South Dallas and Oak Cliff areas, we have a lot of food deserts and a lot of food swamps. Uh, and the food is overpriced here and it's not very healthy. Um, so what, what one of the most important things about what we're doing right now is that uh, we want to set up opportunities for, for people to learn how to garden, people learn how to farm. Uh, we want to see about setting up co-ops in the community and different things like that because there's an old saying, he who controls your food controls your liberation which means the answer to our liberation has been right beneath our feet the whole time. So what we're talking, the people that we're talking to today, we're talking to Darcia, we're talking to Plez, we, you know, we're, we're talking to Trisha. You have to realize that these are, are a holistic liberators. What we're doing is we're liberating ourselves through the earth. This is the first thing that we ever had was the earth and the connection to the earth. And that's why one of the most important things that I wanted to talk to about first was land, the importance of land, and how we've, uh, the challenges that Black farmers have had with owning and holding on to their land, doing Jim Crow, um, due to deficient civil rights protections, um, the social and economic barriers, and I also want to touch on what uh, obstacles we have today as far as land is concerned and as far as access to resources. So, um, Anybody you want to jump on in, uh, we can go ahead and get started with it. Uh, so what are your thoughts on that? We can uh, get started with uh, uh, um, players. I'll, I'll start with some of the, the most recent history regarding, uh, regarding land. The, the reason why we, that, that we hear uh, this type of uh, community agricultural being, um, being a revolutionary act is because uh, as uh, Brother Malcolm said, that revolutions are always based on land. Um, one of the earliest uh, issues, and this is something that you can look up in U.S. law, it was called the Doctrine of Discovery, which is a, which is a legal statute that allows for, uh, during, uh, during European colonialism, uh, colonization of peoples of color's lands, that they could show up and put their flag down and say that this is now, this is now mine for the taking, and it was upheld. Whenever that happened here, after the establishment of the of the United States government, that it has been held, it has been upheld in U.S. Supreme Court law uh, throughout the years. Uh, moving moving up from that time, we have shortly after the uh, shortly after the emancipation of formerly enslaved peoples, uh, that there was upwards of 16 million acres of land that was bought and purchased by these formerly uh, enslaved people and other indigenous people. They bought it with their own money, and they, so they legally, they legally had the rights to it. Uh, based on U.S. law, they had the rights to it. But the, that, number has, that number has significantly dropped to less than a few hundred thousand acres of land, and that was due to white terrorist organization activity literally killing uh, the to killing. And we're talking about the Ku Klux Klan, the White Citizens Council, uh, those type of organizations were because just because the these formerly enslaved people had the audacity to want to step off of being sharecroppers from someone else and be in control of their own the own land resources and their own food they were they were they were punished uh, they they not punished they were they were murdered and killed off um, uh, in that way right and that led to what was known as the the, the great migration of a lot of uh, folks from the south moving up to the north to escape that kind of uh, those kinds of activity. And, and mind you, when we talk about the South, we don't just mean deep South as in um, 
uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida. We're talking about as far up as uh, the, the Carolinas and the, and the Virginias. And so that is one of the land as a tactic of, uh, of racial suppression and control has always, always been used. Uh, even in uh, even going back as far as going back to our uh, to our brothers and sisters uh, in in Africa, the um, the the original the some of the original peoples they their practices of re, of regenerative regenerative agriculture practices was was the basis for their resistance of colonialism. Now they eventually they they lost that struggle, but that was their main understanding and the reason why they put the work into making sure that they that the that the land was healthy and fertile and so that was the reason why they were able to mount the resistance uh that was their motivation for mounting uh to, to mounting that resistance so I'll, I'll let somebody else uh jump in and, and say some more i push back to the notion not on plus's point but in general for everyone our agriculture history and our connection to to food to land to health and wellness did not start with slavery you know so i want to put that out there first before i go further with anything else we were already connected to the land regardless of who you are what your melanin dominant or recessive you were already connected to the land the land is how we have access to health and wellness it, the, once again, if you don't have access to your food or who feeds you has control of your mind, well, where are we living? We're living in more apartments now. Gentrification has happened on many different levels. We're in a pandemic where everything is being snatched. People are getting evicted from apartments, but also being foreclosed on in homes. So once we continue to lose our land, we lose our ability to heal ourselves. So that is a very deep connection with land and health and wellness, holistically being able to get outside in your particular yard and you're not around a concrete jungle, you can actually ingest nutrients via sunlight in addition to air, in addition to having access to the soil. But because we don't have those things and our people have been uh, mistreated and we've also been um, overlooked. And the reason I'm saying that is because once again, we all also go back from slavery, then we go to Africa as if there wasn't any indigenous people here. I am an indigenous Turtle Islander. I am a Native American mixed with African that I don't know anything about. So with that said, let's not always look over, you know, everybody and everything that was already here, what our culture already was prior to this dis-ease, um, these sicknesses and these illnesses in our ability now not to grow because we are collared versus, you know, kale. <laughs> I'd like to touch on something you just said, I said, because I traveled to Turtle Island a couple of months ago with, with my empress. Uh, you know, we're dealing with the history of Lenny Lenape people and, and all of that, you know, so I definitely feel that. And I just want to touch on a couple of things about the indigenous is that I found out that what happened with some of us is that when our tribes were conquered, you know, uh, they they sent us to uh, Jamaica and everything and mixed us up with the, with the Africans and killed the older ones and had the babies thinking they were uh, not from here. You know, uh, some of us chose to die and some of us were captured. You know, um, my uh, we actually found my my uh, my great-grandmother uh, Lucinda Wyatt's name on the Choctaw roll, so you know, I'm, 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 I'm indigenous myself. And, you know, one thing I just read is about how the Dawes Rose kind of like caused us to lose a lot of our land. And when they started posing taxes on us, we started losing because we didn't have the money to pay our taxes. You know, like my family was on the trail of tears and everything. So, you know, we, do, we definitely are going to talk. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Turtle Island and everything because, you know, uh, that is something that, that, um, Actually, my empress put me on to not too long ago about the turtle and everything. So we'll definitely talk. But, but um, you know, as far as the land is concerned, you know, and the spirit that's in the land, you know, things um, like you said about living in apartments and different things like that. I had a conversation with somebody not too long ago. They was like, what are we going to do if the, you know, if the stores close and everything? I was like, we're going to plant our own food. You know, it was like a no brainer to me. But he was like, I don't know how to do that. And it just didn't hit me that, like, that's something that people don't consider, like, 
the Panthers and my uncle, we've been talking, he was telling me about the store shutting down and stuff back in the early 90s. And we were talking about it then and everybody thought they were so secure in this economy, they would say things like this will never happen. And these are the same people now that are like, what are we going to do? You know, so it, it is important that, that we do start growing our own food and kind of get a jump on this thing. Because one thing I noticed is my AB, we, would have, we had a garden in the backyard. We had an herb garden. Even when I was down home, we had 12 acres down there. We didn't have to go to the store for much. And that helped, uh, you know, that's the reason that like my, my AB, uh, they can make $7 a week. But they were able to buy, buy a home and have, uh, you know, uh, clothing and shelter because as far as growing food and and a lot of the things as far as like, I remember every morning at Miami Beach House, Sarusa would wake me up. You know, it was like in South Dallas, there was a lot of, of agriculture and, and community gardening going on with the old people. But what happened is we, we lost our connection because we became so urbanized. And that's another thing too. Um, us being driven into the cities and uh, losing that connection with the land kind of, we, we didn't realize it, but the bright lights of the big city actually kind of did separate us from, from our connection with the land as well, you know, uh, because of convenience. But um, I'll pick on that, uh, I just, like, yeah. that's why when, and, and what we're doing, I like to describe it as a reintroduction of practices that were part of what made a community and really, it was it was so important to the uh, Black and Indigenous peoples communities because we had no other choice. Like there was, um, it, it, you didn't have the options. Like you saw, you talked about uh, food deserts and uh, food swamp. Like let's give some definition of, to that for for folks. Like food desert is uh, is described as a an area where uh, the the people in that space do not have uh, uh, immediate access to fresh, healthy produce. It's not just food. It's a specifically fresh produce. And they, that, I don't, I don't even actually agree with that terminology. Uh, if we're talking, since we're talking about land, a desert is a naturally occurring uh, environment. Uh, you have your, your forests, you have your plains, you have your swamps, you have your mountainous regions. Desert is, is one of those. It occurs naturally. Uh, the, the, the lack of access in any of these areas that is described as a food desert is not a naturally occurring thing. So the real definition would be food apartheid. And that is when mm. one group of people is specifically keeping down, uh, suppressing that, lack, that access um, to another group of people. Uh, going to the, uh, the term food swamp. Food swamp means that you have access to food, but that food is, is trash. Uh, for lack of a better of a better term, so in these in those same areas where there is not you a person would have to travel uh, between a mile or five miles or more to get access to fresh healthy food, they could easily walk and get access to trash food, food that is going to be causing this disease in their body. So we're talking about chicken shacks and burger stops and mm -hmm. uh, and, and fast uh, uh, any kind of fast food that you can think of. Um, also, the the corner stores that all they have is the is the chips. And the sugary, the sugary processed foods, that is what you find in a food. That's what you find easy, convenient access to in a food swamp. And don't give me, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, folks. I'm, I'm not advocating that there should be, someone else should be coming into the community and providing this easy access to fresh produce. We, this is something that we have the, the potential and the ability uh, and more than enough space and opportunity to provide uh, for ourselves within within these communities, we don't have to wait for someone else to come out and say, "Oh, we're going to decide to put a grocery store." The, the the big box grocery stores don't even think that it is worth their time and effort to bring a grocery store uh, into these into these spaces, as evidenced by some of the work by a group called Feed Oak Live here in Dallas. Uh, you can find some information on their webpage that talks about the excuses that the that the the, the big grocery stores use for why they would not open up. Uh, a grocery store with quality food access in some of these areas. And it is just that. It's all excuses. So we have to take matters into our own hands, as we have done um, uh, in time prior to slavery, to chattel slavery in this country, and as we did after the time of chattel slavery in this country, when we did not have a choice, and if we wanted to eat, then we had to grow our own food. So if we want to be healthy, it's something that we got to take in, we got to take into our own hands. Going real quick back to what you were talking about with the um, the uh, Turtle Island indigenous folks, this is something I know uh, Darcy is going is going to jump right in on as well. Is 
the concept of agroforestry. This is another uh, black and indigenous contribution to agriculture as we know it today. Like everyone knows it today as permaculture. This is again, another idea, another, another way of life, another practice that has been co-opted by a group of people who did not start it and used to enrich themselves. Uh, but agroforestry was the process uh, of, having a, of, of, of having a tree as your center. So you might have a meringue tree or a lemon tree or some kind of melon tree. And then that tree would be surrounded by uh, a, a system of beneficial perennial herbs. And then those perennial herbs would they be surrounded by a group of annual crops. Mm -hmm. And then those annual crops would be surrounded by a group of protective crops so that your, the animals and your pets would, couldn't get access to destroy uh, all of this. And so now you are building, a, you're, you're building the edible food that you want to eat. You're, you're providing an environment for your pollinators to come in. You're growing the herbs that are going to provide you with the health care that you're looking for. Uh, and it was all in a regenerative practice. Um, and that is what we are, we are reintroducing. This is not something that is brand new. It's not, a, it's not an idea that uh, it, it's, it's just something we need to get back to. This is this is all all done by people uh, by by folk, people of color, the indigenous and and, and black folks all around uh, all over the world. Right, and so let's change the language, y'all. Uh, I think Claire said something. We're gonna start calling it food apartheid because this is not and that something that's naturally occurring. And uh, you know, Claire and I had a conversation on history. Uh, you know, basically um, kind of touching on the fact that, uh, like you said, nobody's gonna do it for. Uh, so we have to do it ourselves, you know, and that's what's the important part of what players and everyone on this panel is doing is that we're not, they're not waiting for anybody. We're not waiting for anybody. We taking, taking our community into our own hands. This is what's called community control of resources. The history has told us that, that no one is going to come in and is going to help us. There's no legislation or any benevolence from another community is gonna help us. We have to help ourselves. It only makes sense. You know, this is our community. And this is something that historically, even with Wheatley Place, uh, the place where I'm from in 1905, that was considered the, the Black Highland Park. You know, and these people made sacrifice to build up the community. Our Black communities, we had Black doctors, Black nurses. We had a whole lot of stuff in our community where we took pride in it. Uh, of course, uh, we know the crack epidemic, drugs, uh, gang culture and everything kind of destroys some stuff here. But at the same time, we can, uh, the same uh, things that, uh, the seeds that were planted uh, for, that were destructively planted can be uprooted and we can uh, uh, plant things that are constructive. And that's what we're doing right now. So uh, yeah, what players are saying is definitely correct. We need to start using the language of food apartheid because this is something that is, is being imposed on us. And this is something that we can change our psychology on because we, we live on land, you know what I'm saying? There's land all around us. So we, we can use that land to feed ourselves. We don't have to wait on anybody. Right. And I wanted to say something about land too. Our land is our legacy, whether we use it for residential agriculture, it's just so important to me that we keep up with what we have already and share the land that we have to produce more and house more because like like Darcia said, we're going through this pandemic, people are getting evicted. And there's a lot of empty lots out here that some other people might be able to acquire to provide more spots to grow, provide more spots for places for people to live. You know, and I came from the city of Chicago, so agriculture really wasn't I wasn't really strong in agriculture besides my grandma having her backyard, my daddy being a hunter. But one thing I can say during COVID, I didn't have to worry about food because I used the land that I had in my backyard. And I also have a larger farm of a friend that I share where I have some other animals and I didn't have to worry about food. All I had to do was know that what I knew to go back there and process what I had. And I had vegetables, herbs, and meat. I encourage everybody to do the same and feel that same way. I can I? I want to speak on a. There's a someone in the in the chat box that uh, her name is Kathleen. She was asking about why this has to be so political and let's unite together and talk about growing nutritious food. That is is exactly what we're doing. However, we this this program was put together in order to highlight some of the history of agriculture and its importance to um, to the the African the the people of color 
indigenous and black contributions to that agriculture and why we find ourselves in this particular position. And it is, it is, it is truly everyone's responsibility, but we hold a special responsibility to ourselves. And that is what we are discussing. It's not about uh, politicizing. We're not bringing these, these issues up uh, as part of some uh, political referendum uh, to put someone on one side or another. We are specifically highlighting where the, the, the struggle that Black and Indigenous people have been through and the contributions that have been made that have been pushed under the table or outright stolen and co-opted uh, and are now being used for the enrichment of certain groups while the, 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 while our generation, who, where we have our ancestors who started these programs, uh, the, the Black Panthers started the, the, food, the, the free food program. That was then co-opted. While the Black Panthers were systematically destroyed by the state, that program was taken and co-opted and is now was the basis of the, the free uh, breakfast program for schools. Um, you have the, uh, the, uh, the, what is it, the extension farm program was started at Tuskegee University by, uh, by black and indigenous uh, farmers there and is now a part of building these master gardener programs all over the country with little to no mention of how they started and why it's important to know that these are the, that these are the people that started and the struggles that they went to in order to start it. And it's, again, it's being used to enrich certain groups while the communities that are the legacy of these men, of, of these people of color who started these things, that they, their communities are languishing and, and dying and, and left in disease. And there's no mention of the, that help that is, that is supposedly there provided to all is not evenly distributed across all those communities. So that's why, that's why we're bringing it up. It's not a political thing. It's an understanding of the truth of the situation and the facts of the matter and how we, can, how we can now work together to change those things, because it will take all of us. I mean, when we talk about food being political or the politics of it, it is, it's systematically driven to make sure that nourishment is not towards or does, isn't delegated to a certain portion of people. No different than redlining or anything else. We are purposely being set up with environmental racism and many other things um, to political, you know, it's a political movement that is supported by law. Um, there was a farmer's market that was being ran at Paul Quinn College through good local markets when they decided they wanted to pick up and leave for whatever reason. They left. Guess what? They left a permit behind. That permit per prevented me, my soil sisters, from opening another market even across the street. And did, and did that market or did those people or did that city or did this state, you know, go back and say, okay, this market has closed. We know that. Let's revamp this situation. Let's make sure this community could eat. Media came out, everybody came out to say, say, oh, we were feeding, you know, the underserved community, but yet when they decided not to anymore, we were left astray and nobody came. You know, a grocery store was coming, but that's still not natural and organic and it doesn't, what is it called, contribute to the economy of the urban neighborhood either. So it is, it's political all day long. But I'm asking you all right now, if you know something that can help us make sure that we can have markets at the park where everybody comes, where it wouldn't be um, a food desert because the bus stop is at the bus, you know, at the park. You can have the, your kids at the park. Can we have a market at the library? Can we have one at the school, on after school, when, when the kids get out of school? These are the rules and laws and regulations that make it political. And these are the things we need done so we can have access. That's what I would like to say to the point. I just want to say something here that I think is misunderstanding. The Black Panther Party was a human rights organization. And what that means, just to give you an illustration, if we were at a table and we had Democrats, Republicans, capitalists, socialists, whatever your political leanings are, and a hungry child came and asked for a piece of bread, are we going to have a discussion about uh, the politics of giving that child a piece of bread or are we going to make him a plate? So that's all that we're talking about here. We're talking about the right to be human beings. And the fact of the matter is I have a friend named Blanket. And Blanket has a special need. She has mental health issues and she lives in front of the store in my neighborhood. And every 
Everybody gives her, helps her with food. They give her clothes. They give her blankets. But, you know, I talk to blankets sometimes. Blanket goes down the sewer when it's cold because it's warm down there. So uh, it's not about politics to me. This is about the right to be human. I don't care if you're red, white, black, green, or whatever. The Black Panther Party is all power to the people means that black people and indigenous people have been oppressed. And by us allowing that oppression, that allowed the oppression of the rest of the world because only 1% of the population controls everything else. I don't care what color you are. So we're all in the same boat. But what we're telling you is that if we, if we uh, deal with the oppression of black people and indigenous people and liberate them, then that'll change the whole consciousness of the world. Because in order to allow this to exist, because what affects us is Mount Martin Luther King said an injustice, uh, uh, injustice anywhere, anywhere than just right, everywhere. I'm not everywhere. Right. So if it's happening to us, it's gonna happen to you. When crack cocaine hit hit the black community, nobody was worried about it, and then all of a sudden it went everywhere in this opioid crisis. Uh, when uh, uh, HIV was only in the gay community. Nobody was worried about it till it affected everybody. You cannot marginalize communities and ignore them because you think it's not going to affect you. That's like you putting, you getting in the pool with a whole bunch of dirty people and think you're not going to get dirty. We got to deal with everybody. It's not about me. It's about the fact that I'm a father and I have three children. And one of my children has autism, has special needs. And I don't want my children to have to worry about the things, same things I had to worry about. I don't have to worry about them being hungry, not them having a place to stay and things like that. So the thing about it is as a human being, this is not about color or politics. As a human being, you should understand why food is important to the liberation of the people of the world. One thing right. I would like to say is I believe that education is a big way to hold of people back and the ignorance of myself, embarrassingly, a lot of things that we talk about today, I never knew till maybe about two years ago. And of course, I'm, I'll be 49 in April. Uh, and so just the subject on Black Cowboys, just today, to just, just the fact today to equate the Black Cowboys to agriculture, to me, it was just part of the culture, uh, part of rodeos, but just even today, uh, when Brother Dewan said that and it broke it down about the black cowboys in agriculture, it really didn't even dawn on me till today that they were a big part of agriculture itself in, in the raising of cattle and different things like that. So I believe that education is a big part in the lack thereof of us not knowing. Uh, of course, I would probably want it to be involved more into farming if I saw ourselves in a, a bigger light. I'm from the country in Florida. Uh, of course, I went to school, elementary school. I was the only black child there for years and so having that black history component I saw when we went to church, but on a daily basis, I didn't see the great things that you all talking about. And this is so inspiring, uh, more than me being on the panel to discuss, but me being on the panel to learn. Because I love listening to Darcy. I, she don't even notice. I be watching all her videos and the education she pushes anyways. Uh, but just to be on this panel and to learn more about the contributions that our people gave, not only in rodeos, but as far as uh, to loving the land, to cultivating the land, to, to create um, uh, inventions as far as agriculture that's being used today that I didn't even know our people were involved in. So this is very important. And that's why I preach these things to our youth over in Lancaster. So I, I appreciate, I mean, I, um, I teach this to our kids over in Pleasant Grove that you're more important than you even know. And that's the reason why a lot of them have their heads down. That's the reason why a lot of them are involved in things because they just don't know. And that's why this, what you're doing today, needs to go further than just here. It needs to, uh, to go out to the community so these kids will know they are valued. Absolutely. Uh, I said the same thing too. And, you know, these kids need to be, their minds need to be exercised more towards gardening, being cowboys, hunters. Because I really admire my dad bringing meat to the table when he went out and hunt. Instead of these kids using guns to kill each other, they need to learn how to use guns for, you know, positive things and bow and arrows and learn and teach them how to, you know, operate those equipments and turn it away from violence to something positive, putting meat on the table. I'd like to say there was another, another uh, someone in the chat, uh, 
Imara, I hope I'm saying your name right, I hope I'm not butchering it, uh, she was asking about if one of the organizations was uh, going to be able to, to start a, um, uh, a pilot project. Uh, and we are, we do have pilot projects working that are going to, that are along the lines of co-ops here that are community-based that will, that the community, all the community gardens that we are starting will be feeding into that. So there will be locally grown food by the community being that the community will have access to uh, right in the areas that it is, that it is most needed. So we are definitely working on that here. Uh, anybody that's got a program that's, that's somewhere else in another city, uh, somebody mentioned the Detroit, uh, the, the Detroit Black Food uh, Food Network. Uh, shout out to Brother uh, Malik Yakini up there. They, what they're doing, they're definitely one of our role models. Um, a lot of the information that uh, that I that I was giving out today is from a young lady named Leah Penniman uh, uh, up in uh, New York State. She has the, her, her book is called Farming While Black. That uh, is a is not. It is so much more than just. Um, it has, it has resources listed directly into the book uh, outside of just telling her personal story of how she got into agriculture and what it means to her and her family and how they built their farm. She, has access, she, she provides the resources that you, that you need that you can directly reach out to to begin your programming and learning how to build this kind, this kind of community resource and, and giving, giving control of the resource of food back to the community and taking it out of the hands of people from outside those communities who only look to enrich themselves and don't actually care about the health of those communities. So uh, Leah Penniman's Farming While Black, definitely check that book out. Uh, there's another brother named uh, Booker T. Watley who came out of the uh, Tuskegee University program behind George Washington Carver. Um, his book is called, uh, is called How to Grow, uh, How to Make $100,000 Farming on 25 Acres of Land. This is another how-to book that talks about these are practices from, from 50, 60, 70, 100 years ago that are still relevant today and, again, have been co-opted and are used now um, to enrich people that did not start these programs. We're talking, about, we're talking about CSA programs. It was originally called, this man started this. It was called the Clientele Membership Club, uh, the, pick, the, the Farm to Table Movement, the Pick Your Own, uh, the pick your own Come to the Farm and Pick Your Own Basket. All of these things were pioneered by, by Booker T. Wiley and were specifically designed to show small to medium scale farmers how they can, can be profitable and community minded in the way that they operate, the, that they operate their farm. Um, and just talking about George Washington Carver, he was the, everyone knows him for the peanut, but it's not because of the invention of peanut butter, it's because of what legumes, a peanut is a legume, and legumes have a special relationship with, a, with ribosomal bacteria, that the bacteria is able to live in the roots of the, of the legumes, and then they in, they in turn capture nitrogen and fix it back into the soil. So what we're talking about here is the, the transitioning from this monocropping culture. Now, again, this is something that goes back to, that, that goes back to the, the cotton crops. We're decimating the soil, and this is, again, all talking about land. You cannot just grow one specific crop over and over and over again in the same soil. You have to rotate your crops and make sure that those crops have that special relationship so that they are, the, 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 the crops take what they, some crops take what they need from the soil, others help fix back into the soil what the soil needs to stay healthy and well. So please research about uh, about uh, crop rotation. And it, it is a very old, it's a very age old practice Definitely not something new, but something that is very necessary to maintain the health of your soil. As as my girl Darcia always says, like you are not growing, you're not really growing. You're not growing your plant. You're growing the soil. And there's another from uh, from our brothers and sisters back in uh, in, in Africa. There is a, a process called African Dark Earth that was started in uh, in Liberia and the the, Ghana, the the Ghanaian women farmers. They would they had a combination of bone char and ash and residue from palm oil and soap making practices that they would then and an inoculate from the from the forest that you're gonna have to go out and, and research for yourself and find out about that they were it was a layering of the soil to continue to rebuild the health of the soil and the the u.s government would go they go over there and take soil core samples from that area and they could literally tell the same way that you would read the the, the rings of a tree to find out how old that tree is, that that the the soil course sample could tell how old the community and by how many layers of the African black soil uh, were in there. Uh, talking about composting, uh, the earliest 
first documented uh, process of composting dates back to uh, one of the earliest dates back to Africa in Cleopatra's time. Doing that same core testing, uh, core testing process, they would it would show that during the reign of Cleopatra, she had a whole dedicated a group of people that were studying the earthworm and its contributions to the soil. So that when you test the when you look at the, the core samples of the soil during her reign, the the soil is much healthier than any time before or any time after in that area where they where they lived and worked. So the 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 contributions of uh, the African continent uh, and the indigenous peoples of North America and South America cannot be understated. These are all things that were for the first documented history of all of these popular, these, these, these practices that are now popularized and people are using to enrich themselves that are not, that are not helping to build these communities of, of color where the people who, who their ancestors created these things, that is, that's what we need to, that's what we need to get back to and credit needs to be given where credit is due uh, so that we understand the true value of it. I would like to bring that. something to the forefront. Just one little thing, everyone. Um, not only do we already know because of current and everything how treacherous, you know, the slave trade um, at its minimum was. But at the end of the day, don't think that you're getting ready to make me believe that I know how to farm everywhere. I can't leave right here, right now, and go up to Detroit and farm. Guess what? Because their situation is different. Their soils are different. Their resources, their nutrients in their soils are different. So I didn't come from everywhere, just popped up over here, and you cracked the whip and I started farming because that doesn't exist. You can't just farm anywhere, anywhere, how you were farming where you came from. So I want to bring that, you know, that reality to the forefront for everybody so you can further understand how diverse and um, the reason we have varieties of certain plants because those type of plants can have companions. Companion planting is the same thing we need to be doing as companions um, of, of the actual people that are walking on the earth have a diverse situation in which we can have understanding of what we need. We have melanin dominance, those that are on this particular panel. We have different nutrient needs. So we are deficient already, even if somebody comes to our neighborhood and opens up a store. Because guess what? The type of produce, how it's being grown, is not really helping to nourish the melanin dominant person. There are different requirements for different people. So farming mm. and gardening, make sure you do so based on what your needs are. You would never go anywhere and just start gardening, hopefully, or farming without testing the soil so that you learn what the soil is deficient in. So therefore, when I start eating and I start nurturing, nurturing myself and I start planting, I need to know what's deficient in me first. Because this whole garden that you're doing is supposed to be feeding you too. You're supposed to look and feel a certain way when you go trying to incorporate and help other people. You know, bring them along with you with your journey. But at the end of the day, understand what your deficiencies are. And that's what our people did. They're not just out randomly, you know, planting uh, plants and, and flowers. A lot of those flowers are edible too. So pay attention to those things in addition to when you start learning about the culture, when you start learning about the history, horticulture, permaculture, any of those cultures, agriculture, pay attention to it where it can be permanent. It can be a permaculture for you, not so much that it's how everybody else is doing it, it's how Pless is growing, it's how Miss Darcy is growing, it's how Trish is growing, it's how Koi is growing. I bet you we're all growing differently. Thank you. Uh, I, I, see, I just want to touch on I just want to touch on something that you said as far as historically. I was uh doing some research on the Akan people and I found that the the Akan people who built Kemet when the when they raided and, and uh you know the different uh, people came into Kemet, those people were actually driven into West Africa. And so the place where they went to go get the slaves were the Akan people. So they would do they 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 studied us to a they master knew us to a point to where they knew where the DNA of the master builders and the master agriculturists and the master architects where all that was concentrated at. And they made sure that they they drew from that population of people. So you're absolutely right. Whether it be the indigenous people here or the Africans over there, they studied our us to a factor where they knew exactly where to go to get people. 
Yep. The same that thing happened with the uh, the Mende and the the Wolof, uh peoples. The, they were they were expert rice farmers in Africa and were specifically targeted by the slave traders in the Carolinas and brought over so that they could now and to what now has become the multi trillion dollar uh, rice industry that was that was over there. And, and it was be it got started because they stole people from another land who knew they they didn't just randomly go out and say, oh, this uh, we need slaves to work. Let's bring them over here. These, the, when they came and colonized this continent, they did not know how to grow, didn't know how to survive. So what do you do? You go get somebody that knows how to that knows how to grow and knows how to survive, and you enslave them, and then you rewrite the history to make it look like you were the good guy. All the books that you would want to learn any of these subjects we're talking about. Um, the two favorite, pla no, I got three favorite places. Number one is Pan Africa Connections off of Marseilles, y'all. You can go get the gear. You can get a backpack, you can get a hat, you can get some knowledge. Then the Doc Bookshop in Fort Worth, if you're over that way, yep. down in Shauna, they got some bad, nice, cool, cool, you know, everything you can think of, activities and things as well, but books. And then St. Kofa. If you need something to read and you want some vegan food at the same time, those are the three places, Pan-Africa Connections, the Doc Bookshop, and St. Kofa. Those yeah. are the places I would go personally. Anybody else got any more resources other than the library? <laughs> uh, another book by uh, a lady named uh, Judith Carney. She wrote the book uh, Black Rice that talks specifically about the history of uh, of the rice industry and how, the, how it got its start and the, uh, the real originators of uh, the proper rice growing technique. Even the, the, the transplant, as, as Sister Trisha Ray, like we get a lot of our transplant from, for the, for the veggie project uh, from uh, Sister Trisha Ray and from uh, Restorative Farms over at the MLK Center. These are local places that are starting, um, that, are, that will st get transplants started for your garden in a, in, a seasonally, in a seasonally specific and accurate way, right? So that you know what you need to grow throughout, throughout the season uh, and that you're putting in the right things for, again, for our particular area here in North Texas. You, you can only grow certain things during certain times of the year successfully, depending on what your infrastructure looks like. Uh, and so working with local, local growers rather than just going to, the, to, the, um, to your Home Depot or your Lowe's, just because it's convenient, find someone locally who is going to be who is starting those programs and keep the, keep the, keep the money local uh, and, and make sure that you are getting uh, heirloom seeds, uh, people that are starting from heirloom seeds and non-GMO seeds uh, uh, and that nature. Uh, there's a young lady named uh, Selena that's in the Fort Worth area uh, that you can uh, you can reach out to her. Like, just contact me. I'll put you in contact with her because I don't have her. She just she's just on Instagram, um, <laughs> but she she's another great resource for uh, for growing practices. Um, somebody in the chat said uh, Michael was asking about our community gardens being networked for sustainability or standalone models. Uh, we are networking for sustainability. The goal of uh, the Veggie Project is every garden that we start is going to be part of a network of any anybody else who wants to work with us and have um, so that we understand what everybody is growing with the goal of eventually starting a community market market space where you can where we can trade in these goods in these this, this homegrown produce without even the use of, of money. Now I, I know that everybody needs money. We got to be for you got to bring in money. That's we're all under this system. There's no escaping capitalism for for now. So there are, there are outlets, we are working on outlets for that where the produce can be sold into other community, uh, to, to other community businesses uh, and, and big box businesses for that matter. Uh, but we're also working together so that we can get back to practices that have to do with our sustainability and our, and, and our livelihoods outside of the use uh, of money as well. So we are working to network those things and we got some good pilot projects uh, coming, up here, uh, coming up here very soon. Uh, I think sister, yeah. Yeah, uh, I also, I wanted to uh, say real about... quick. Uh, okay. Well, let me just say something real quick about what he said. In the Bible, they talked about gleaning, to where you would take ten percent of your crop and for the poor and and you know the people who who didn't have anything. So if like each it, it, even if we of course we have to feed ourselves, even if we took at least ten percent of each garden and said this would be allocated strictly to the poor and the disabled and stuff, then that would cover everybody. And then we would still be able to create, uh, you know, build our own businesses and build legacies uh, for our people as well. And I also want to touch on one more thing, and I'm going to let y'all speak, is that with DNA memory, 
the reason I was bringing up everything about the indigenous people, the people and the can people and everything like that is with DNA memory, once you introduce information to yourself that's already just locking your DNA from your ancestry, it unlocks. It's like a key. That's why knowledge is, is key because it activates that memory because you're remembering things. You're, you're, you're bringing things back together in your memory and that's all that learning is about is re remembering or uh, things in your mind that you already knew. But I just wanted to add that on. Uh, Sister Darcia brought up companion planting. Uh, and we know that the indigenous contribution to companion planting. Darcia, could you kind of give the people the uh, definition of what companion planting means? So this is my so love of life. Um, I always talk to the, I have a, I teach for the Mark Cuban um, Garden Club. I have some major melanin garden club heroes. And I talk about companions all the time because children really can relate to friendships and they can relate to their mom and they can relate to their dad and those types of relationships. So when you plant certain crops, let's say tomato, tomato's best friend in the whole wide world is basil. That's why you also cook them together. That's why they're in all the sauces together because they complement each other. Um, it's almost like bean and rice. You know, they make the complete protein, so they say. So they complement each other. Um, you also have the three sisters. You have the squash, the corn, and the beans, you know, that can be grown together. What they do, did you know that plants actually talk? They actually knock on each other's door and say, hey girl, you got some sugar? Can I borrow some sugar? they not watering me right can I borrow some of your water so they give each other nutrients and if you understood bacteria and fungi you know that bacteria doesn't really go anywhere so on all these commercials with this COVID and stuff and they show you stuff they show you bacteria sitting there and then they spray it and then they wipe it away okay so bacteria and fungi are important in the soil so it just stays there but it needs fungi and it needs the rooting systems of certain um, plants that can actually penetrate like radishes also, they could be good friends to anybody because when radishes go on the ground, they send all them tendrils out. They, they go in the ground fast. So they're a companion plant because they help bring some sort of nutrients, no different than your, your wife or your, your friend or what is that companion bringing to the relationship? And if you got a lot of friends and a lot of people around you that are not benefiting you and giving you or exchanging with you, then they're not companion planters. So you might want, they might, you know, um, not grow together at all. There's certain things you cannot grow together. So pay attention to what goes together and what doesn't. And um, yeah, with that said, that's companion planting at its finest. Cool, cool. Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, you know the- no, we got the about- Go ahead. Well, I know we got we got about uh, fifteen like we got about fifteen minutes or so left on the official time. Um, I, I just wanted to extend a, a real quick out to everybody out there that's watching. If you have any questions that like specifically you want to get asked, like you can go ahead and throw those up in the in the chat box. I know I, I've been trying to, to watch and, and catch uh, what people are sharing or, or asking, so please uh, please go ahead and chime in, and uh, we can. While we wait, Koi, what are you growing now? What, what's in the ground? Uh, right now, we still have collard greens in the ground. We have probably about 300 onions that we have uh, in the yeah. ground. Of course, we're still growing the 60 fruit trees that, that we're in the process of getting those all pruned up right now. Uh, we have a different variety of, of kale growing. Uh, we're also doing some tests here with uh, agri uh, aquaponics. And so we have several things growing kale and other things growing in aquaponics tank. Uh, we have broccoli in the ground as well. And we're still trying to figure out how to keep those rabbits out of our uh, broccoli. That's one of, the, one of the battles that we're dealing with right now. I yeah. went to Michigan and went to go see um, uh, Baba Malik um, at D-Town Farms. And they had all kinds of, uh, you know, like rabbits and groundhogs and everything so i'm gonna ask him um thank you but i think the one thing that everybody's been asking me about that they cannot control is these squirrels so um the rabbits i've heard but the squirrels have been um the most drama that i've been dealing with and i haven't had a solution for that either but i'll try to same find here. that same here squirrels as well yeah them little rodents i don't know they cute but they ugly to me they just negative <laughs> 
Corey, can you, Maybe could you, you uh, we haven't touched on it yet. Could you uh, talk a little bit about aquaponics uh, while uh, Quez is like checking out the question? Please. Well, I'm new to aquaponics. Of course, we're arts and science, so we do a lot of experiments. And so what we're doing, we have, uh, right now we're using koi fish and goldfish to see if we could be able to grow uh, successfully with those using their, uh, the whole process of the waste of the, from, it's like a mm -hmm. symbiotic relationship between um, the, uh, the beads, the plants and the fish. But to be honest with you, we're still new. I'm still learning. So it's, it'd be good to connect with brother. Uh, I think this is Darcia said, uh, what's his name again? Oh, uh, Jerry. Jerry. I think Jerry would be a good resource. Now that she told me that, that's one of the people I'm going to go to uh, to find because we've done a lot of tests. We've been successful uh, with growing in aquaponics. But to be honest with you, I couldn't. I, I don't want to give any um, bad advice because we're still learning. Jerry and Plus together. I mean, that's, that's right. A cold, that's, that's a cold comp. That, that, that's a two hitter quitter right there. That'll knock you out because I mean, he's got access to all the equipment and goes around and does it. And then Jerry, you know, has his like professionalism in it as well. So together, you need to bring them too. You'll get it. Anybody interested in uh, what Darcy said? She does is based in agriculture. Uh, everything that I do on a daily basis is based in on uh, is based on agriculture as well. I just happen to have a focus in hydroponics. Uh, the company that I, that I work with uh, specializes in uh, in the equipment needed for. Uh, commercial scale hydroponic operation, but not just commercial scale for uh, for small scale as well. So, uh, I'm I'm very well versed in uh, in hydroponic operations and, and different different growing systems. Uh, also, uh, I got my start in it at Big Tech Urban Farms. And I, I can't believe I forgot to shout them out uh, at Big Tech Urban Farms out at uh, out at Fair Park. Was well, one of the only demonstration yes. farms uh, hydroponic setup that you can go to uh, and see how these systems work and get firsthand knowledge of that. Now, there might be a little access issue right now because they're using Fair Park as a, a vaccination site uh, for a lot of people in the city, but uh, they are normally always open to the public. If you want to learn about, you can, you can go out there and volunteer with them or just go out there and get a tour and see what's going on. So I highly recommend uh, if, you are a, if you are in education, if you got a daycare, if you anything like that, um, uh, and you want to learn something about it, you can contact them or contact me, and I will I'll set it up so that we can take you on a tour and get you some uh, information about uh, how to grow uh, effectively using hydroponic systems. I have Plus to. Plus, set up the. Oh. I was going to tell them you set up the system at Lincoln High School. Yeah, the uh, the irrigation system for yeah. a traditional raised bed uh, system that's over there at uh, that Darcia teaches with over there at uh, at Lincoln High School. So I'm, I'm, I'm good on the irrigation for for soil systems uh, as well, everybody. Cool. Cool. All right. Anybody got anything else they want to add before we get out of here? Sorry, right, I clicked out there for a minute. My, my connection was unstable. Oh, I, I'd like to add one thing real quick that we as um, – this is probably the most important part. A lot of people that – think that they don't have a green thumb it is it is it what it has to do with is our is 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 basically gratitude we are the the capitalism as it's not as it is practiced on this continent and by this government is uh is a terrible terrible way to transact business especially when we are using a resource uh as important as the land and as the earth we capitalism looks at the earth as a commodity and that's something that is just to be taken from and quanti quantified and used and distributed it, it all willy nilly. If you feel like you, you may not be having so much luck with your plants because how, how often do you, uh, do you pray over your plants? How often do you pour libations out to your plants? Do you sing to them? Do you speak to them in a loving and generous way? And this goes back to what Sister Darcy was talking about with your, your network and how, why the plants have these relationships with each other, the companion planting. How, is your, how do you treat the company that you keep and your network? How often are you, are you praying with each other and exchanging those beneficial resources that you all have? So if you take the time, I, I've seen it myself in different growing environments where I would teach a hydroponics class and the tower is there and then in one, in, in one school, the kids are, every time they see, they come past the they're like, hey, Basil, how you doing? Hey, Tyler Green, 
y'all looking really good today. And another school where they they were not really they were not really speaking to the plans. They they didn't really care. All they were just waiting on their lesson once a week, and they didn't they weren't really interacting with the plans. You could see the difference in the growth and the vibrancy of the uh, of the crops themselves. So it is very important that we understand that that if we are growing to nourish ourselves to use to use these things to nourish ourselves, that we understand the transactional relationship that is being built. It is not just the plants are giving and we are giving the nourishment and the support for them to grow. And we have to understand that that is the real, that's the nature of the relationship. You don't, nobody just gives something to be, to, to, to be given it freely. Everything in nature is, uh, in existence is a, is a mutual in exchange, whether, whether we understand it or speak the same language or not. Like I don't speak mycelium bacteria, but I under, in understanding the importance, I can give that, I can give that bacteria uh, the, the, the environment that it needs to, to, to proliferate and, and to be vibrant. So uh, I just wanted to, to speak on that, that we have to remember, the, remember what it is that we are doing and that we can't just keep taking and taking and taking and think that, uh, that we're going to, that we're going to survive. And that's, that's, that's an interesting said that because the way that we, the way that I see that we change the culture is just by what we're doing right now is by networking, because in order for the the things to remain the way that they are, the means of the production has to be in the hands of the few, and you and at, at the access of the people, uh, and, and kept out of the access of the people. But by us doing community gardening, what that's doing is that's giving us control of the means of production for our food, clothing, and shelter for our basics. So once we do that, then we have to spend less and less in the market in order to provide our needs. Now we may, uh, you know, uh, have to buy uh, uh, periphery things like, um, you know, maybe cars or different things like that. But when we have the ability to grow our own food and plant our own food, to create the textiles, to uh, planting cotton or, or having animals like goats and things like what Trisha was doing. Uh, and when we have the uh, resources to grow our own trees, to get our own textiles, to build our own homes and things like that, then we can start doing those things in our community. And that's what uh, the Panther Party, that's what we call uh, the, 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 the intercommunalism. It's where we network within ourselves to where we can provide our own resources. But we realize until the capitalist world, until cap and since capitalism still exists, we still have to have certain ways to be able to sustain ourselves in this society. But the way that we deal with ourselves is that we work together, just like Plez and I are working together. I'm meeting Darcia, I'm meeting uh, Coy, I'm gonna meet Jerry you know, the people who are on the call, you know, all of us working together. When you see community gardens or community farms or co-ops, support it, you know what I'm saying? Buy, buy your things from them. If you want to uh, reach out to us and learn how to, uh, how to get into community garden and community farming, we're willing to work with you. The more we get the people working towards the land, the more liberation that we'll have. Instead of you having to worry about where your next meal is going to come from, you can go out in the backyard and, and pull you up a tomato or pull you up some greens or, or, you know, we used to make preserves. You know, my grandmother made preserves in jars. We had peace preserves, all types of stuff, you know, okra, all these different things. It was canning being done. These are all the things, and, and, and these are not new things. Like uh, Plan says, we are reintroducing this. These are things that our ancestors were doing that we got away from. Just like they talked, I was talking to my mama one day, and she said, you know, uh, uh, your great grandmother used to use the herbs because they believed in order to, to heal yourself, you had to rid yourself of the mucus. And I say, sure, sure, that's what Dr. Sebi is teaching. But see, everybody thought what Dr. Sebi was teaching was revolutionary and new, and oh man, we never thought about this, but my ancestors already knew what Dr. Sebi was doing was he was bringing the, the culture and the traditions of the ancestors up to date, and that's what we're doing. We listen to Darcia talk. Uh, about the history, or you listen to Coy talk about the Black Cowboys, you listen to Flares, and then we bring it up to date, you know, and let you know how these things can work for us now. In, in biblical, it says that it was in the beginning, so it will be in the end. In the beginning, we were, we were living off the land. The only way we can survive with this COVID-19 thing, you know, uh, we have to get back to the earth because the earth is the only thing that's going to be able to heal us. That's our mother, our body. Our, our uh, skin is made out of the dirt. Our, uh, our bones are made out of the rock and the minerals. Our blood is the water. 
You know what I'm saying? And what keeps our heart and stuff pumping is the fire. So all of these elements exist within us. And in order to keep those things, we have to get it from the earth. The dirt, if you really know what dirt is, dirt is, is the remains of plants and animals. That's where the nutrition comes from into the plants. The plants have the nutrition and whether you eat, if you're eating animals, you're just eating the cycle nutrition that they got from the plants that they got from the soil. If you're eating the plants, you're getting it directly from the nutrients of the earth. All of this is coming from the earth. We are the earth. We're made of earth. You know, this is our vehicle that we move around on while we're on this planet. Now, when we go somewhere else, we'll probably do something different. What I'm, what I'm saying is just like with your car, if you take care of your car, you know, to run forever. But if you don't take care of your car right, it's going to break down. That's the same thing that happens with our bodies. Our bodies break down because we don't take care of it properly. We're eating synthetic foods. Skip Shockley told me back in 1996 that eating synthetic foods changes your DNA structure. And what you're going to start having is synthetic people. You know, so we have to get back. You know, you stop feeding your children all this fast food and all this processed food and all these different things and give back to the earth. What's that? Nutritional destruction of black people. Break it down for us. Let us know about it. End of the day, you were talking about Dr. Savy. Who taught yeah. Dr. Savy is the same person who taught me, Erica Badu, and many other people, Dr. Africa. And um, he Lady wrote Africa. book. Yeah. And it is autographed 2018. I got my certification with him, through him, um, individually. So it was very intimate, you know, learning experience. But um, our ability to decay as a result of our diet, um, I'm currently, I like losing weight right now, right? So my trainer is all like, you're not going to diet, you're going to live it. And I was like, oh, right, right. Yeah, I don't want to die for it. You know what I'm saying? I want to live it. So at the end of the day, that's the synopsis, you know, making sure that you understand what is killing you. And it might be different for different blood types. Right, right. Right on. And that's where you come in with holistic health. You can let us know what we need. See, when, it's not, when we, we work together, you know, my grand, great, my grandmother, rest in peace, say the more we get together, the happier we'll be. As long as we stick together and work together, it's nothing that we can't do. But uh looks like we over the time. Um, but I appreciate each one of y'all being on the panel today. This has been great. It's been very informative. I'm sure the people out there learned a lot. Um, yes. and Thank you to everybody out there that took time to, to join in and, and listen to what we had to say. Like, we really appreciate it, folks. I'm sorry. What you doing? We want to learn. We want to learn from you all out there too. So if you if you have some resources, please drop that into the uh, into the discussion space. Uh, and our our the, the team here at the Dallas Public Library make sure it gets shared out with everyone who was on uh, who was a part of this as they send out the video for everyone to uh, to enjoy at their at their own leisure or go back through to, to pull out the gems that they gleaned from it. So we appreciate y'all out there. I, want, I wanted to make sure. I wanted to throw in a little thing from me and my heart. I encourage people to grow what they know so they'll be familiar. And when I put my community garden together in the beginning, my vision was for maybe my neighbor to grow corn and squash. And I was taking care of the collard greens and the Swiss chard. And if we pull together as a unit, we'll have enough to feed ourselves right from our backyards. So I encourage people to just grow what you know. Right on, right on. That was beautifully said. And so uh, I want to thank our panelists uh, for being with us today, for sharing your knowledge and your passion that we could all feel. Even though we're all virtually connecting, I felt everyone's passion and I could see it in your, your, your eyes and your faces and your hearts and definitely in your words. So I want to thank you for sharing that with us today. I want to thank you for letting me be a part of your world and your spaces uh, by the little bit that I can do to help and like we said, if anyone else wants to drop anything in the chat, please do while it remains open. We just launched a short little poll to help us get a little bit of feedback for this Grow With Us session to help us plan future programs that I don't think can be any more exciting than this one that we just participated in. And also I wanna thank everyone who attended today for spending an hour and a half of your time with us on this very, very important subject. And we will uh, save the chat and gather all of this information if you left your contact information for our panelists, we promise to get that to them. 
And uh, with that, I am going to close us out uh, shortly and let the library do any sort of uh, closing message they need. Thank you again, Helen. We appreciate it. And thanks to the Dallas Public Library, Oak Cliff Veggie Project. Thanks to Coy Porter and FAWC, to Tricia and uh, the um, Candy Girl Chicks, and of course to Darcia. Man, she dropped a bomb on me. Appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you.